Grace and peace be to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining me today. My name is uh, G. Bruce Greer. I'm the author of a number of books uh, in my series entitled The New Covenant Understanding Series. Uh, those books are available both in Kindle and paperback on Amazon.com. Now, in this video series, which I've called my home video series, I'll be reading from those books. So today I'll be reading from this book here entitled In Essentials Unity, In Non-Essentials Liberty, and In All Things Love, and then subtitled Things That Can Unite or Divide Us as the Body of Christ. So this uh, book, I'm going to be, I will be breaking up into several videos. Uh, video one uh, covered in the book, the preface, uh, which really had a lot to do with uh, why I wrote the book, why I think the book is necessary. Uh, I also went over the overview of the entire book. And then section one, which was based on the title of the book, In Essentials Unity. So in part one, briefly, we looked at um, five different uh, areas where various people have tried to look for unity in the body of Christ, of which I maintain that there's only one area that we can, that our unity is established in, that being our new covenant at one. So the other, the five that we looked at it was, first of all, uh, in Christian doctrine, unity in Christian doctrine, that is what we believe. Uh, and secondly, unity in Christian mission, that is what we do. Three, unity in Christian traditions in whom we believe. And number four, unity in Christian practices, that is how we practice our religion. And I don't find any of those as the uh, basis for our Christian unity. However, the uh, New Covenant Onement, which is the fifth one we covered last week, uh, has to do really with the work of the Holy Spirit. It is by His Spirit that we are baptized into Christ. It is by His Spirit that we are joined. And it is by His Spirit of agape love that our unity is established. So because He first loved us, uh, we love Him and we're able to love others. And Christ in His uh, uh, last prayer, uh, in the upper room in John 17, prayed for that unity, and that unity would be the unity of oneness in the Spirit. And so that's uh, where we established then. Uh, then we looked at some things that are necessary uh, that have to do with that. These would be, you might consider these subcomponents of our unity, and there were seven, uh, and I defined what I think is essential for each one of these. So first, we looked at what's essential for salvation. Secondly, essential to be part of the body of Christ. Third, to essential to the Christian faith. Fourth, essential to be called a Christian. Fifth, for to be uh, essential for Christian ministry or leadership. Uh, six, essential for the purposes of God, both individuals and for the body of Christ. And seven, essential to New Covenant at one. So you'll need to refer back to that video of for the details. So in this uh, next series, we're going to move into part two in the book, which is uh, in non-essentials liberty. And then I'll be breaking that down. This first uh, 2A will be covering what uh, what is a non-essential and then uh, some other aspects of that. And then we'll look at some specific areas where there is Christian liberty. And we'll be looking at whether... Uh, these liberties uh, are healthy or unhealthy. We'll be looking in part 2A at worth, uh, healthy and unhealthy styles of worship. Uh, part B, we'll be looking at healthy and healthy, unhealthy teachings and doctrines. Part C, we'll be looking at healthy and unhealthy practices. Part D, healthy and unhealthy evangelism. And five, healthy or unhealthy mission, uh, missional statements and missions for the parts of the body of Christ. So with that bit of introduction, I'm going to jump right into the book in that section. Now that's covering part two in non-essentials liberty. So I'm going to begin reading here. We'll begin by examining Christian liberty in their context of New Covenant at One Minute to frame our discussion of non-essentials common in contemporary American Christianity. 
will then evaluate whether the liberty given to us in Christ for a particular non-essential is healthy or uh, unhealthy. Uh, let's begin by, what do I mean by non-essential? We've defined non-essential as anything not among the essentials discuss, discussed in the previous section. That'd be part one. Non-essential to salvation, to being part of the body of Christ, to the Christian faith, be called a Christian, Christian ministry, the purposes of God, or um, a new covenant of one man. Importantly, non-essential non does not mean unimportant, just not essential. Non-essential can be very important, either for good or bad in the body of Christ, as measured by whether they further or hinder Christ's formation in the body of Christ. The next question is, what does liberty mean within the new covenant? First and foremost, we need to see the fundamental link between liberty and the Holy Spirit within the context of the new covenant at one minute. Here's how the Apostle Paul concluded his great comparison of the new and old covenants. And I'm reading from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. Many people mistake the grace of God as seen in the gospel of grace as being absent of any constraint whatsoever. No, no, no. New covenant one frees us from all external laws having to do with our relationship with the Lord within this covenant. But a new law is working internally in us that the Apostle Paul described as, quote, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, uh, end quote. That's from Romans 8, 2. This is why the Apostle Paul can also make these other statements relating to our liberty in Christ within this new covenant. I'm going to be quoting uh, next, 1 Corinthians 6, 12. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. And then again, in 1 Corinthians 10, 23, Paul writes, All things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. And then uh, a third time, in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, Paul writes, but take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. Even though we are given great liberty within New Covenant One Minute, there are things that are lawful but not profitable for us, things that can master us, things that do not edify or build us up, or things that may cause the weak to stumble. All of the Apostle Paul's epistles identify lawful behaviors that are not profitable and tear down individuals in the body of Christ. Even the Apostle Paul, often identified as the Apostle of Grace, puts legitimate and important boundaries on our liberties for the sake of the body of Christ. It amazes me that God gave mankind, including the endemic man, great liberty. Now I'm quoting Genesis 2, verses 16 and 17. The Lord commanded the man, Adam, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely. But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For on the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. From the very beginning, the Lord put mankind into his good creation, with great liberty, to enjoy that creation. Quote, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely, end quote. But with this freedom also came that warning. Quote, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. End quote. Within the great liberty we have in New Covenant at one moment, we must still observe certain principles, not external laws, but the internal, quote, law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, end quote. Uh, and here are several bullets. Uh, this liberty is being led by the Holy Spirit and not our own making. Uh, next bullet, there is great liberty to make our own choices in union with the Holy Spirit but they must be evaluated whether they are profitable, build us up and others up categorically as being healthy. Uh, next bullet, this liberty must be totally free of seeking direction from the tree of knowledge and good and evil. The old, gov uh, old covenant was governed by 600 plus commandments and ordinances of that covenant. The old covenant has become obsolete through Christ's fulfillment of that covenant. 
and ended at the cross it was where it was nailed forever. Therefore, those enjoying new covenant onement are freed from all external laws, rules, conventions, or traditions imposed as a requirement for holiness. According to the Apostle Paul, putting oneself under external laws, rules, or practices is to put oneself under a curse. Quote, for all who are works of the law are under a curse, end quote, Galatians 3.10. Such requirements are unhealthy. Next bullet. Many other external rules we choose to obey, however, can be profitable and useful for building up ourselves and others. These can include various house rules needed for living or meeting together and other rules needed for one another's sake in this present world, such as reasonable speed limits, such as reasonable speed limits. I categorize those as being neutral, having no direct effect on the believer in the body of Christ. Understanding Christian liberty is those things that can be left to personal choice as guided by the Holy Spirit within a framework of things that are profitable, edifying, and not stumbling to the weak, we can now define what non-essential might mean in the New Covenant of One. Three identifiers can guide us with the help of the Holy Spirit in evaluating the liberty we have in non-essentials. Number one, healthy. To use the Apostle Paul's admonitions, things that are profitable, edifying, and do not stumble the weak. Two, unhealthy. Things that are unprofitable or damaging that tear down rather than build up uh, or cause members of the body of Christ or others to stumble. Three, neutral or permissible things that are neither healthy or unhealthy in relation to the body of Christ and new covenant one. This comprises a large area of human life involving personal or corporate choices or others out or other outside fat forces. Some expressions of Christian liberty are generally healthy. After forming a good idea of what is healthy, we can better identify the things that are unhealthy. Things that are neither healthy nor unhealthy can reasonably be called neutral, and liberty provides freedom in these areas. So now we're going to be looking at healthy and non-healthy, unhealthy, non-essentials. I'll be looking at aspects of contemporary Christianity in these five areas as being healthy or unhealthy. So in um, we'll be doing this in the video series. In uh, this video, uh, part 2A, we'll be looking at healthy and unhealthy styles of worship, forms of, forms of worship services. Then we'll be covering in part B, uh, teachings and doctrines, part C, 2C, practices, part 2D, evangelism, part uh, 2E, uh, missions. So we need to understand, first of all, what determines whether something is healthy or unhealthy. Let's return to something our Lord had to say to Pharisees, accusing him of casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub. Now you'll find this in Matthew, I'm reading from Matthew 12, 33. Either assume the tree to be good as well as its fruit good, or assume the tree to be bad as well as its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. The Lord compares judging a teaching by its teaching, uh, by judging a tree by its fruit. The metaphor of fruit harmonizes with the Apostle Paul describing the effects of the Holy Spirit as fruit. And this is from Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Fruit is a common illustration used in scriptures for the life of Christ growing in the believer. Uh, out of Ephesians 5, 8, 9, we read, For you once were in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Here's another passage in which the Apostle Paul correlates spiritual wisdom and understanding with bearing fruit. And I'm reading from uh, Colossians 1, verses 9 through 12. For this reason we also, since the day we've heard about it, have not ceased praying for you and asking that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you will walk in a ma manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit, in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all perseverance and patience 
joy, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance in the saints. The Lord directed us to look at the fruit in order to judge the tree. The fruit that we are instructed to look for is the life, the characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit. And those were the nine we just read. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And that leads to bearing fruit in every good work. Doctrines and practices that I categorize as unhealthy, by contrast, will not result in fruit in the fruit of the Spirit. Patterns in the lives of those who believe or practice particular things are proved to either be healthy or unhealthy by the fruit that they produce in the life of the believer. Given time, healthy beliefs and practices will produce good fruit. Unhealthy doctrines and practices produce bad fruit and cannot produce good fruit. Neutral do doctrines and practices may not produce fruit in, in any way. So my approach to healthy, unhealthy, and neutral non-essentials. I'll first discuss healthy non-essentials, and that's a joy to speak of. However, it's also important to direct directly identify things that are opposed to New Covenant Atonement, so the contrast can be uh, better seen and addressed. Therefore, I'll, I will also address some unhealthy non-essentials, so you will see how they oppose or inhibit receiving the full value of New Covenant Atonement that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit so desire for the body of Christ. Neutral non-essentials commonly neither encourage nor discourage health and growth of the body of Christ. So we'll be looking uh, next at uh, the this this uh, we'll be particularly looking at healthy and unhealthy styles or form of worship services. So the next section is called healthy styles or forms of worship. Although non-essential forms of worship are very important to the part to the part of the body of Christ, uh, life of the Holy Spirit in the body of Christ. Over the millennia of Christianity, there have been all kinds of healthy styles of, or forms of worship service influenced by the times, the culture, and other factors. Others, however, have unhealthy or neutral effect upon the body of Christ. First of all, liberty in how we assemble. One of the most beautiful, if not widely held, heralded liberties in Christianity is the liberty we have in how we assemble. Most religions require a sacred temple, shrine, or holy place to be the center of worship. In New Covenant uh, Christianity, the Apostle Paul proclaims, quote, Do you not know that you are a temple of God, and that the Spirit of that God dwells in you? That's 1 Corinthians 3.16. That's an amazing statement. In other words, we don't need to go looking for a temple. We are the temple. The Apostle Paul goes further to say, quote, The temple of God is holy. And that is what you are, 1 Corinthians 3.17. So we individually and corporally are not just any temple, but we're the holy temple of God. Gone is the temple of God in Jerusalem or any other sacred place. We are now that holy place. Some might think that the Apostle Paul's words blasphemous because they misunderstand what is required to be holy. The first occasion of something being called holy in the scriptures is when Moses was met by the holy God, Yahweh, in the burning bush. The Lord told Moses, quote, do not come near here, remove your sandals from your feet, for the place which you are standing is holy ground. Exodus 3, 5. What possibly could make dirt holy? The presence of the Lord made the ground holy. Ground was not holy of itself. So it is that our earthen vessels can be called holy because of the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. Get it? You are holy because he is holy and he dwells in you. This That means that Christians can and have met in all kinds of locations. Of course, like other religions, we can clean ourselves up, put on special attire reserved for holy use, and gather in buildings dedicated for Christian worship. The true temples of God, however, are believers indwelt by the Holy Spirit, assembling in whatever location suits the need. So, in the course of Christian history, Christians have met in some of the oddest places to worship. Consider meeting in caves, catacombs, prisons, gulags, restaurants, bars, schools, parking lots, sports arenas, campgrounds, state and national parks, under tents, 
in the fields, on the beach, in the mountains, in halfway houses, in roadside chapels, and in personal homes. All these are examples are given to glory in our liberty to worship together with the presence of the Lord and blessing and sanctifying our assembly just by his presence in us and among us. Praise God. Christian liberty in Christian worship. It seems that the Spirit of God can inspire music of all types and genres that we can individually or corporately use to worship God. This is to the glory of God. While Christians may choose to limit their worship at a particular time and place through Gregorian chants, that does not mean that other Christians in the liberty given by the Holy Spirit might not find forms of contemporary Christian music more inspiring. The one doesn't negate the other. The Lord is pleased with all worship that is centered in his gracious nature, his gracious works, and uplifts our spirits in him. I can even include some secular music. Beyond my many favorite Christian artists and songs, I have found that I can share and enjoy many secular artists and songs with the Lord. Some of it may even be inspired by his spirit without, the, without my or the artist's knowledge or credit. After all, the Apostle James writes, quote, every good thing and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variation or sh shifting shadow, James 1.17. Is it possible that many of the inspirations have made our lives easier, safer, healthier, and better in any number of ways, even delivered to us through non-believers, are ultimately gifts from God the Father? Certainly, quote, the every good thing given, end quote, might extend to many things in our lives that we can thank God and others for. Let's certainly thank God for the variety and liberty in worship music. Uh, liberty in music, the arts, dance, performance, and other expressions of beauty and truth. Now consider the beauty of Christian liberty in areas that can enhance our worship of God whether overtly Christian or simply echoing divinely inspired themes. This too is to the glory of God. Are we able to give him glory for some of the great contributions to our lives that have come through these varied means, even if created or performed by non-believers? This is captured by in this encouragement for the Apostle Paul in uh, Philippians 4, verses 4 and 8. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Three dots. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, think about these things. I found the Lord can even use secular movies to speak to me. So as not, so as not to be misunderstood, these revelations must always be judged by scripture and affirmation by the Holy Spirit. I'm glad that the Lord has given us this great liberty to enjoy, be blessed, and even see him more clearly through a variety of avenues, including those I've just mentioned. So perhaps we can join with the Apostle Paul in his encouragement, quote, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to our God and Father, Ephesians 5.20. Now turning to liberty and matters of conscience. Another great liberty that we have is in matters of conscience. The Apostle Paul devotes a lengthy chapter in his Epistle to Romans on matters of religious conscience. And I'm going to be quoting from Romans uh, chapter 14, uh, verses 5 through 8. So Paul writes, One person values one day over another. Another values every day the same. Each person must be convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it for the Lord, and the one who eats, eats so with regard to the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. The one who does not eat, it is for the Lord that he does not eat, and he gives thanks to God. For not one of us lives for himself, and not one dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord, or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Here in this passage, the apostle gives Christian liberty and such things as the days which to observe with special significance, making it a matter between the believer that, quote, convinced in his own mind, end quote, and being, quote, for the Lord, end quote. The apostle Paul extends this not just to religious days, but every aspect of our lives, quote, for if we live, we live for the Lord, end quote. 
What does it mean to live for the Lord? I believe it means that there's great liberty in how we each in participation led by the Holy Spirit live our lives. The Apostle Paul rightly so adds some constraints to Christian liberty, just as we saw earlier. I'm going to quote this passage from Romans 14, continuing in chapter 14, verses 13 through 19. Therefore, let's not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. I know and am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but the one who thinks something is unclean, to that person it is unclean, for it is because if because of your food, your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking in accordance with law. Do not destroy your choice of food, that person for whom the Christ died. Therefore, do not let what is good for you, uh, to, for you a good thing to be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteous peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For the one who serves Christ in this way is acceptable to God and approved by other people. So then we pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another, end of quote. So the Apostle Paul puts our Christian liberty within the boundaries of love, boundaries that avoid hurting others, particularly those in Christ, our brothers and sisters, and a love that seeks to make for, quote, peace and the building up of one another, end quote. How are we to determine this? The Apostle Paul directs our thinking to the kingdom of God as being, quote, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. End quote. So let's let the Holy Spirit rule in our hearts, in our choices, and all that we do that generates righteousness, peace, and joy in the Spirit. Now, liberty in matters of culture. Another beautiful Christian liberty is how Christianity works in and for all cultures. Consider how different that is from many other religions that are fit to a particular culture. One obvious one is Judaism under the Old Covenant. For many good reasons the Lord kept Israel separate from all other cultures while under the Old Covenant. This had a lot to do with the fact that the Old Covenant was a matter of external law being imposed upon people who left to their own endemic natures would quickly turn to many of the other ungodly practices of their heathen neighbors. In fact, even with the law as the center of their culture, many of them, and ultimately Israel at large, did turn to pagan ways and pagan gods. Quite the reverse is true of the New Covenant Christian faith. It moves right into all kinds of cultures and transforms them from the inside outwardly. This can easily be seen by religious Christians who still understand, oh, this can be easily misunderstood by religious Christians who still understand Christian faith through the Old Covenant. Under the New Covenant, the life and person of the indwelling Holy Spirit is stronger than sin. Quote, for sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace, end quote, Romans 6.14. I've heard wonderful testimonies of people whose lifestyles and identifications were wholly part of a subculture that might be defined by sinful behavior. Once born again of his Holy Spirit, these people were transformed from the inside outwardly, and many have gone on to evangelize or minister to those otherwise sinful cultures. The presence of God was greater than the presence of that culture in them. It is not that God conformed to the culture, but that through the power of God's Holy Spirit, people in that culture could be transformed into his image, independent of the culture they had previously identified with. Now, uh, body ministry within the body of Christ. Here's another form of Christian liberty uncommon in man's religions, including some forms of Christian religion the liberty of the full body of Christ to minister to the body of Christ and others in a variety of ways. Contrast this liberty with the practice common to man-made religion, which restricts ministry only to a select class of priests, gurus, degrees, or the ordained. Consider this abridged portion of Apostle Paul's explanation of body ministry, and I'm reading first from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4-14. through 14. Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are a variety of ministries in the same Lord. There are a variety of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, 
distributing to each one individually just as he wills. For just as the body is one and has many parts, all the parts of the body, although they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we are all baptized in one body, three dots. We were all made to drink of one spirit, for the body is not one part, but many. And in another location, Ephesians 5.19, Paul writes, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your hearts to the Lord. And then in Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you and with all wisdom and teaching and admoni admonishing, admonishing one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts. Uh, I feel fortunate to have come to know the Lord in 1970 at a time and in parts of the body of Christ that practiced this form of body ministry. I've since participated in other portions of the body of Christ where credentials from specific seminaries or Bible schools were required to participate in ministry to the body of Christ. This was certainly not true in the early church. The early apostles were chosen by the Spirit, and few were educated in religious institutions of that day. I'm not advocating giving individuals unchecked liberty in how and what they minister within the body of Christ. There are abundant warnings about false teachers in the epistles. The Apostle Paul further counsels the body of Christ to, quote, recognize those who diligently labor among you and are in leadership over you in the Lord and give you instruction, 1 Thessalonians 5.12. In fact, the Apostle Paul gives this exhortation on the role of the fivefold ministry. This is from Ephesians 4, 11 through 13. And he, the Lord, gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the equipping of the saints for the working work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. So in this passage, the very purpose of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Sounds like the Apostle Paul understood these Christian giftings to encourage and build up body ministry, not for entertainment, careers, power, money, or other aims that some enter Christian ministry for. I'm fortunate in my 50-plus years of life in the body of Christ to have known a good number of Christian ministers who faithfully work toward this purpose. I've also seen many who sought self-centered purposes to the detriment of the body of Christ. May the good Lord grant us, those servant ministers, who train us up as cohesive and cooperating body to accomplish what the Lord intends for us, quote, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ, end of quote. unhealthy styles or forms of worship services. It is healthy to identify unhealthy styles or forms of worship services practiced in the body of Christ and avoid such forms of worship service altogether. I'm going to go through several here, uh, beginning with this one. Focusing on our own or other sinful condition. One unhealthy form of worship service is any style or form of worship service that focuses on our own or other sinful behaviors or condition. By sinful, I mean those Christian worship services that emphasize how pathetically wicked we are in general, or in some cases, how pathetically wicked sinners outside that particular body of Christ or assembly are. In both cases, these forms of worship service are condemning in nature and have the root in the Old Covenant that the Apostle Paul described as a, quote, ministry of condemnation, end quote, and contrary to the new covenant that he described by contrast as, quote, a ministry of righteousness, end quote. That's found in 2 Corinthians 3, 9. The Apostle Paul makes it clear that condemnation has no part in the life of the believer. I'm reading uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 1, followed by verses 31 through 34. Therefore, there's now no condemnation at all for those who are in Christ Jesus. For what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? 
who will bring charges against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ is the one who died, but rather was raised, who is at the right hand of God the Father, who also intercedes for us. So, if there's condemnation for those, quote, who are in Christ Jesus, end quote, and God the Father is fully for us and not against us, and it is Christ who is now risen and sits at the right hand of God interceding for us, who is the one that condemns? You might say Satan and I'd agree, but you might rightfully also add any pastor, teacher, or anyone else, including songs that condemn. Christ is also interceding for us against these. In fact, one of the unheralded feats accomplished with Christ's death on the cross is nailing, quote, all the decrees against us, end quote, to the cross. I'm reading here from uh, Colossians chapter 2, verses 14 through 23. Having canceled the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. Three dots. If you've died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as, quote, do not handle, do not taste, or do not touch, end quote, three dots, in accordance with the commandments and teachings of man. These are matters which you do not, these are matters which do have the appearance of wisdom and self-made religion and humility and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. Apostle Paul says that Christ disarmed Satan and his hosts of demons from using the law or other forms of external laws against us, but concluded that, quote, self-made religion, end quote, continues to beat up the body of Christ with various forms of condemnation. In the Apostle Paul's words, these forms of worship service, quote, have the appearance of wisdom, three dots, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence, end quote. So let's get rid of any styles or forms of worship that are full of self-made religion and self-made humility that are worthless in generating any spirit-led transformation. Let me extend my criticism of condemnation of individuals of the body of Christ to include condemnation of those outside of Christ. The Apostle Paul addresses this directly in this next passage. Now I'm reading from Romans 2, verses 1 through 4. Therefore, you have no excuse, you foolish person, every one of you, who passes judgment for in that matter in which you judge someone else, you condemn yourself for you who judge practice the same things. And we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. But do you suppose this, you foolish person who passes judgments on those who practice such things and yet does them as well, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and restraint and patience not knowing it's the kindness of God that leads you to repentance, end quote. Here the Apostle Paul is not just addressing passing judgment on others' behavior, but concludes by saying that in so doing, we, quote, think lightly of the riches of his kindness and restraint of patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance, end quote. The Apostle Paul is saying that we misunderstand his grace and ability to transform people as requiring our judgment, when in fact it is his kindness that, quote, leads to repentance, end quote. Here we need to understand the biblical meaning of repentance. The Greek word here and elsewhere in the New Testament is metanoieo, uh, whose Greek roots are meta, meaning a change, as in metamorphosis, and noeo, meaning to think. So it is God's kindness that leads to a change in how we think. This can begin with how we think about God himself. Only as we see God most clearly in his kind, loving, and gracious nature are we able to be transformed by his spirit. Quote, but we all, with unveiled faces, looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord, are being transformed in the same glory, from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the spirit, 2 Corinthians 3, 8. Our Holy Spirit-inspired transformation only comes from looking at the glory of the Lord and that glory reflected in ourselves 
and others in Christ as we and they grow in that very image of Christ. Another uh, negative uh, form of worship and style of worship is focusing on the need to do more or be more. If you're unfamiliar with the gospel of grace, you may not find it easy to see this style of, or form of worship as unhealthy. You may even see this form of worship as necessary or even healthy. Many parts of the body of Christ think that they strongly believe in the grace of God, yet they only see this grace as a matter of salvation by grace through faith. They then proceed to make works a priority, even though the Apostle Paul makes it clear that both salvation and works proceed from the indwelling Holy Spirit in the believer, the work of God himself, with our participation with his spirit. Quote, and I'm going to read the Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we would walk in. them. This passage clearly states that it is the grace of God through faith that saves. It is also his work in us that leads to, quote, good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them, end quote. The difference is that emphasizing believers to do more is an external demand. The internal working of the Holy Spirit is an internal leading, motivating, and empowering and an outworking of the purpose of God in the believer and the body of Christ. Using terminology from the field of economics, the old covenant is a matter of demand, while the new covenant is a matter of supply. If you listen carefully to worship built upon old covenant themes, you'll hear songs urging Christians to do more or be more. Here are a few examples of their shortcomings compared to new covenant one. Uh, first uh, bullet is songs calling us to, quote, get nearer to God, end quote, when in fact we are in Christ and are in the Father through union of Christ, that's in John 17, and we are, quote, one spirit with the Lord, end quote, 1 Corinthians 6, 17. We can get no closer than we already are. To paraphrase Watchman Nee, how foolish to try to enter a room that you're already in. Next are songs pledging our yielding obedience or service to God instead of our participatory life in his spirit, then in and of itself will lead to the fruit of the spirit. And we read Galatians 5, 22 and 23. And the good works he prepared for us to walk in, which Ephesians we read was Ephesians 2, 10. Also uh, unhealthy are songs calling us to change our hearts, follow Jesus or cleanse us, when in fact God himself has already cleansed us from all sin, Hebrews 10, 14, and God's own Holy Spirit is working in us, forming Christ in our hearts, Ephesians 3, 17, and giving us the new heart promised in the new covenant, Hebrews 8, 10, and 10, 16. Also unhealthy are songs that call us to come to the cross or pick up our cross, when in fact we have already been crucified on the cross with Christ, Romans 6, 6, and no longer come to the cross, but to the throne of grace, Hebrews 4, 16. While these themes sound good to our natural minds, they belie what our triune God has accomplished in New Covenant Woman. Another unhealthy worship practice is pleading with God to do what he has already done. Again, a few examples and their shortcomings with comparison to the New Covenant. Uh, first of all, is pleading with God for mercy when God's great mercy has already been given us fully in Christ and to all, Romans eleven thirty two. Why should we call on God for mercy if we knew him as the apostle described him? Quote, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love for us, which he loved us, even when we were dead in our wrong doings, made us alive with Christ and by grace you've been saved. In quote, Ephesians 2, 4 through 5. Also unhealthy is pleading with God, forgive us, when in fact God has already fully, fully forgiven us. Quote, for by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. End quote, that's Hebrews 10, 14. And another, another unhealthy worship practice is pleading with God to draw near or for the Holy Spirit to come into our midst, when in fact believers are already in Christ, 1 Corinthians 1, 3. 
and those in Christ are already in the spirit, Romans 8, 9, and one, and one spirit with the Lord, 1 Corinthians 6, 17. Other uh, aspects of worship that are unhealthy are anything based in Old Covenant ceremonies or practices. Some parts of the body of Christ emphasize unhealthy Old Covenant ceremonies and practices in their worship services. Um, now, here is uh, one emphasis on coming to the altar to receive something from God. This can take many forms. While not necessarily wrong to come forward to receive from God, this form of worship can make it seem as though this is the only way to receive from God and may explicitly or implicitly imply that receiving from God is through some type of human intermediary. In reality, Christ now in the new covenant is declared the mediator between God and man, 1 Timothy 2.5 and Hebrews 8.6. These practices seem based upon the old covenant, old covenant slash Levitical practice of coming to an old covenant priest to receive forgiveness of sins. However, in the new covenant one meant Christ alone is the high priest of the new covenant, and we are encouraged to come to the throne of grace, not for forgiveness of sins, but in our times of need to receive grace, Hebrews 4, 16, directly from the Lord. No altar, no other priest, no preliminaries. Another unhealthy practice is services patterned after Old Covenant rites or practices. Again, in this case, it is not as if there's no liberty occasionally to draw upon some Old Covenant rite or practice, but the danger is in institutionalizing these practices. I've observed individuals or entire congregations marching around the sanctuary in some form of Jericho march. Another is calling a, quote, solemn assembly, end quote, as for, uh, called for at times by old covenant prophets. Related would be calling for the body of Christ to, quote, repent from our wicked ways, end quote, as in this old covenant conditional charge, quote, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear them from heaven, and I will forgive them for their sin, and I will heal their land, Second Chronicles uh, 7.14. All of these old covenant practices have been done away with in the new covenant. Uh, a next uh, unhealthy practice is campaigns built around old covenant required tithing, or promises of, quote, opening the gates of heaven, end quote. Mandatory tithing is part of the old covenant used by much of the body of Christ to stimulate Christian giving, especially to fund programs or needs. Certainly, Christian giving and generosity is the very heart of our triune God himself and is exemplified by those led by this Holy Spirit. This new covenant form of giving, however, is not due to demand, but motivated by the generous supply of our Lord God, who has freely given us all things in Christ, Romans 8.32. Emphasizing material symbols and emblems over sp spiritual realities. Again, I'm talking about um, unhealthy uh, practices, uh, worship services. Man-made religion depends on the use of symbols, emblems, and other material representations in lieu of spiritual realities. This is unhealthy when those things become a surrogate or a replacement for the things of the spirit. I'm not suggesting an austere style or form of worship devoid of any visual aids or draw, or to draw our attention away from the things of this world and towards the life and reality of the spirit. I'm only speaking against making these material aspects the center of our spirituality. I'm quoting Hebrews 12, 18 through 24. Uh, the writer of Hebrews writes, For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched or to a blazing fire and to Darkness and doom and a whirlwind, whirl whirl, and to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words, which sound is such that those who heard beg that no further word be spoken to them. Three dots. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to a myriad of angels and to the general assembly and parts of the body of Christ of the firstborn, who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits, of the righteous made perfect into Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, into the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of uh, Abel. End of quote. So whenever, wherever and whenever we assemble for worship gather, gather, let's practice looking beyond the scaffolding of whatever location we're meeting in. 
of whatever symbols or emblems of Christianity may or may not be present. But seeing one another as being, quote, the general assembly and parts of the body of Christ of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, end quote, and of the, quote, spirits of the righteous made perfect and to Jesus, end quote. Neutral styles or forms of worship. Let's remember the overall principle that in non-essentials there should be liberty. In this sense, there is liberty for a diverse mixture of styles of, and forms of worship. This in, itself, in and of itself is healthy. Think of all the diversity among humans across cultures and across time. True Christianity is unique in its adaptability to the needs of humans across cultures and across time. It's wonderful. Of course, if we remove our man-made conventions, then the God-inspired and God-breathed body of Christ can worship in great freedom, liberty, and joy. Let's rejoice along with the Lord in our liberty and diversity in worship. So we're going to end this uh, video session at, with that <clears throat> before we turn to the next part of uh, uh, non-essentials uh, and the liberty we have there. I'll close in prayer. So Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, and Holy Spirit, uh, thank you for forming us into the body of Christ. And you have given us great and wonderful liberties uh, but also uh, warnings and, and uh, admonitions about not uh, where those uh, liberties can be misused and at times can be harmful to ourselves and others. So Holy Spirit, guide us in those things that build up the body of Christ, that edify one another, and help us to transform individually and collectively into your image. Uh, we pray all this in Jesus' name as we seek to love you more dearly, follow you more nearly, uh, pardon me, to see you more clearly, love you more dearly, and to walk you with more nearly day by day. In Jesus' name, amen.